Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 17. This week's guest is San Diego photographer Amanda Dahlgren. I've known Amanda for several years now. She was one of the first fine art photographers I met here in San Diego, and since then we've become friends and colleagues as part of a local photo group called the Snow Creek Collective. One of the things that really drew me to Amanda's work is that she has a really good eye for formal composition, but she also has a really inquisitive mind, and her work brings together her ability to make something visually interesting with her desire to investigate social phenomena. And in the time I've known her, we've had a number of really great talks about photography, so I was really pleased to get the chance uh, back in June to sit down and actually record one of those conversations. So the first series of hers that I knew, uh, which you'll hear us talk about later, is called Pre-Abandoned, and it's a series of architectural studies of newly built homes in master plan communities. I'll read her statement for that series. Photography has a rich tradition of capturing the abandoned home, often showing the physical marks of the deterioration of the inhabitants' lives. In this series, I am exploring the beginning of this life cycle by capturing new residential construction in master plan communities. Where others see the hope and possibilities of a new home, I see pre-abandoned spaces, the American dream promised by the model homes, unfulfilled by financial missteps, broken relationships, or simply the realities of the hardships of life. And then, more recently, Amanda has been working on a new series that involves re-photographing pornographic magazines, her goal being to look at the women depicted in them and consider them as human beings with all of the complexity that that implies. Now, on top of being a photographer in her own right, Amanda is also a photographic educator. She teaches at Grossmont College here in the San Diego area, and she's also heavily involved with the Society for Photographic Education, serving as the chair for the SPE West region. So we started off talking a bit about her role as a teacher and came back to that later in the conversation as well. Anyway, without further ado, here's my conversation with Amanda Dahlgren. So this last semester, I taught at Grossmont, uh-huh. um, which was awesome. I yeah. taught uh, history of photography, which I love teaching. And then um, I taught, for the first time, a portfolio class, mm-hmm. um, which was just amazing. Like, these students are just, like, risk takers, and, you know, it just was really, really rewarding. It was mm-hmm. very cool. Yeah. 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 So. I saw your pictures of the uh, of the portfolio walk that you yeah. did. I didn't get a chance to make it to that, but yeah. it looked pretty awesome it was really cool there was a lot of people that came and it wasn't just the you know students family and friends Mm -hmm. there's only 11 students but there's still quite a few people that came and wanted to check it out and Mm -hmm. even people from snow creek who came which oh yeah it's kind of cool yeah yeah i'm not sure they realized necessarily what it was Mm -hmm. i don't know if they you know didn't read all the (laughs) stuff i sent but (laughs) they came and they were super supportive and like i guess bob was uh talking to one of the students for a long time and then sent her a follow-up email and like he's, he's a yeah. good guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Um, you know, as, as I've gotten to know a lot more people and it really seems like something's happening here yeah. in San Diego. Like, like it seems like there's, we're having a moment maybe, you huh. know, like something is on the verge of, yeah. I don't know. I just keep seeing, more stuff happening, more, more events, more, um, you know, like the snow Creek, you mentioned that's the photo collective that we're both part of, um, medium festival, obviously, um, Mopa has been here for a while, but Mm -hmm. like, there's just like, I feel like there's a lot of stuff going on and even the established museums like Mopa is, has been doing a lot of different stuff lately. Yeah. And, um, like the San Diego Art Institute, obviously they shook things up a whole bunch yeah. in the last couple of years. So yeah, it's, it is exciting. Yeah. I don't know if I really have th- like stopped to think about it, but you're right. Um, yeah, in a place like Mopa, I think they're becoming really conscious about wanting to do more outreach to the community in mm-hmm. a kind of unique ways. So I think that's one of the things that they were excited about Open Show. Mm-hmm. about that didn't come out grammatically correct but um <laughs> that 
you know, this was a way for them to involve the community without, you know, hanging kind of emerging artists work on the wall, mm-hmm. um, which they can't always do. Although there is some, the latest exhibition, I don't know if you've seen it. It hasn't officially had the opening yet, but the Beauty and the Beast. I haven't um, seen it, but I saw the, um, I saw the announcement for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I think there's maybe about 40 artists in there. It's a group show that Deborah, uh, Klotchko, um, curated and there's you know huge names in there but there's also people that like i've met at medium you mm-hmm. know that have their work in there which i think is really exciting mm-hmm. um and some really cool innovative stuff mm-hmm. yeah yeah so being a docent there is fun because i get to go to the trainings and yeah kind of learn ahead of time or kind of start thinking about it maybe before the general public you mm-hmm. know kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's on their radar right yeah 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 now so you and I, I'm trying to think, is it fair to say we met through Medium? I think so. I think that's right. Yeah. I and think. Like I, back the first one when it was in, uh, at the W? Did I we? didn't meet you there, but okay. I, I think if I'm remembering right, I think that I met you at the portfolio walk that was at third space. Okay. Um, yeah. the second year they did yeah. it. And, um, and I remember... Because I had only, I, I didn't attend the festival that year. That's the only one I've missed so far. Okay. But I remember, um, I went because Jonas Yip was yeah. um, participating that year. And I think the first year, I'd met him the first year. Yeah, he's but, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but uh, I'd met him the first year, but then he wasn't doing the portfolio reviews that year. And then the second okay. year, yes. the first year they didn't do a portfolio walk either. Right. But I, I remember I saw your work. You were showing the um, architectural, the interiors. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a pre, pre-abandoned. Pre-abandoned, yeah. 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 And I remember, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember I, 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 I met you there. I saw your work. You were showing it. And I had recognized it because I'd seen it on Lens Scratch before. Okay. That makes sense. That was probably around that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'd seen it maybe a year before. Could be. And, uh, and yeah, that's, then we sort of hit it off from there. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you bring us, bring up Jonas. Like he's somebody that I think I really admire for his wanting to build community, mm -hmm. you know, like, and he doesn't even live here. He lives up in LA, but I remember that first medium festival in the W Mm -hmm. he was not participating in portfolio reviews, but he hung out in the space where everybody was like all nervous to go in Mm -hmm. um, and was just like pumping people up and saying, you know, you're going to do great. Do you have any questions? I, you know, I've done this before. Do you, you know, I don't remember exactly what he was saying, but he just was very, very supportive. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like the best part of being part participating in that festival is, is meeting all the people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Now, like at that time, like I figure because I had seen your work through Lens Scratch before I met you, which I guess that was the second year, but yeah. like like for me I'm pretty fresh. I like the first meet year of Medium was the first time I ever showed my work to anybody. Okay. But like so how long had you been doing it at that point? So if I had already been in Lens Scratch, that means I think that Aileen featured Aline featured me in Lens Scratch after I had a review with her at the first medium. Mm-hmm. So what year would that have been? Uh, maybe 2012? I don't Something like that. Know, something, yeah. Um, so I got my MFA. I finished that in the fall of 2011. Okay. Um, so, and it's funny because my thesis project is not something that I've re- really ever shown that much at portfolio reviews or mm-hmm. anything like that. So by the time I was showing at medium, I was working on that pre abandoned, which sort of conceptually came out of my thesis work, but is just visually very different. Um, mm-hmm. so it must've been at least a year or two later yeah. after my MFA. So, and so like, like I, I obviously, I don't have an art background. I didn't, I don't have an MFA or 
you know, whatever, anything like that, really. Well, you uh, say but, obviously. I don't think that's obvious at well, all. I only, I only say obvious because it's like the second thing I ever tell everybody oh. that I ever meet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not obvious from your work or the way that you present your work. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I just mean because I, I tend to harp on that. Yeah. Um, um, I think I think that that's one of those things that sort of feeds my imposter syndrome, you know. <laughs> um, but I'm always really curious what what that's like. Like, what did you get out of it? You said you, that your thesis project isn't something that you've done a lot with afterwards, and I wonder is that like I don't know. I feel like everybody talks about thesis projects and yeah. MFAs and I think there's sometimes a stigma with mm -hmm. quote student work. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I don't know if that's fair because I, I think some, you know, some of the work that I saw from my, you know, classmates, colleagues was really, really strong. Um, but there's a, there's a way in which work created in that environment can be, not your own mm -hmm. in the same way that work that you create totally on your own is, you know, mm -hmm. so it, that you become, uh, kind of molded by your professors, by other classmates. It could be in a really great way, or it could be, I don't even know how to explain it. Um, it just isn't, it's not your own in the same way, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. You know, yeah. it's, it's, there's people who influence you, you know, who, uh, well, I mean, I guess there's always people who influence you, but, but like when there's a grade attached or there's a evaluation attached, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of tend to take professors criticism maybe more seriously than you would, you know, if you have like an artist group that you talk to people and you mm -hmm. kind of blow people off and say, I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. it seems like one of the really valuable things to me, or at least what I've heard is that having that crit experience, um, it, like most of the MFA programs I've heard of involve you know, group critiques yes. of your work as you're progressing. And that's like figuring out how to have that language uh, when you're doing critiquing other people's work, right. figuring out how to receive criticism and know what to do with it. That's yeah. like, seems like one of the biggest values, Yeah, you know, cause like it's, I had no fucking idea what I was doing <laughs> when I first started getting reviews. Yeah. Um, I think it is incredibly valuable. Um, but it's also insular and some programs are better at that than others. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the school, but there's a big school that, um, just, I don't know, a few months ago, or a month ago or something came out with like their MFA grad, you know, students show or their work or whatever. And it was featured somewhere. And I kind of looked at it and I thought, this is really sad because all the work looks the same. Mm -hmm. And I really don't believe that that is doing the students any service, you know, that I guess, you know, that's doing them a disservice because mm -hmm. it's, they're not being allowed to kind of grow and flourish in their own way. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think a really good professor, which I strive to be, you know, a really good program will let the students be who they're supposed to be. Yeah. Um, so I kind of didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it, I is, mean, it is valuable. Yes. Yeah. It's absolutely valuable. And one of the most valuable things about an MFA is it just, pushes you, you know, you have deadlines, you mm. have, and, and the, you know, the intellectual rigor, I mm. think more than anything is, you know, pushes you to think about things in a different way. And you just get challenged in a way that you, that you'd have to seek out if you weren't in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that thing that you said about the work all looking the same, yeah. that's a pretty common complaint that I hear about, about, um, M uh, MFA grad shows mm -hmm. and not just necessarily even in one, in, in one school, but like across, like, like there it's, I, I, I just last week read, um, uh, another piece complaining about artist statements and complaining yeah. about, um, I read that and I read your rebuttal yeah. and that's awesome that it was picked up. That was it's really cool. Well, yeah. but it's like, it's like one of these things that kind of drives me nuts, yeah. you know, and that particular piece, that guy, it's not anything new. I've heard this complaint about a lot from a lot of people, but just this idea that like 
MFA programs and uh, being what they are tend to produce really, I don't know, he, like that guy's o- not... Over-conceptual, over-intellectualized right. work where the image, the craftsmanship doesn't stand up to the to the ideas. Right? Yeah. 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 But that's not MFA programs. That's something that, I mean, I think that MFA programs are a symptom, I guess, of, you know, that's what's valued today. You know, you go to any, like you go to MOPA, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the stuff that's hanging on the walls, you know, as when I'm leading a tour there, when I'm a docent, you know, one of the biggest critiques, I guess, or, or criticism that, that people have, if they're kind of allowed to, to speak freely is like, I don't get it. This picture's, you know, ugly or it's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's funny. I mean, especially with things like appropriation, like how, you know, how did this artist get away with this? If you think about somebody like Richard Prince, you know, Mm -hmm. like people get really angry, like Mm -hmm. he's stealing, this is plagiarism, this is wrong. Um, But, you know, the, the idea that he's working with, that he's worked with since the eighties is something that's still, is interesting to curators and to, you know, to people that are kind of at the the higher levels of Mm decision-making, I guess. Yeah. And whatever else you can say about Richard Prince. I mean, like I have my opinions about what Richard Prince does, but whatever else you can say about him, he's definitely like people are having a conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, so on some level it doesn't like whatever you think of what he's doing. Like, I don't think that that's something that you can dismiss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And another one is Doug Rickard that, you know, mm-hmm. people get oh, kind yeah, of upset the, uh, about yeah. the Google uh, yeah. street view. Yeah. And it's funny. Like I'm, I tend to be one that doesn't get mad. Like I get, I just think it's all fascinating. And I, I think you're probably similar in, in a lot of ways that like, I, I tend not to put my foot in the sand or whatever and kind of say, well, that's wrong. Or this is, you know, the way it should be or whatever. Like I'm more, I think thoughtful and especially the older I get and kind of trying to figure out what does it mean or what, and, and that kind of is exciting to me is trying to understand because I I think my first tendency when I heard about Doug Rickard's work was like, well, if he's a street photographer, which he says he is, then why doesn't he get off his ass and go, (laughs) go out, you know, and do street photography? Like, Oh, maybe he's like an agoraphobe. Well, that's kind of interesting. You know, Mm -hmm. like how does an agoraphobe do? Is that right? The, people who can't go outside. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that would be kind of an interesting twist on street photography, but you know, he's not. So when he spoke at medium, um, I was kind of prepared to like dismiss him, you know, and especially kind of the way he presents himself. Was that the second year? It was definitely at the Lafayette. Um, okay. But I'm not sure yeah, which I, I year didn't see it was. It, so maybe yeah. that was the year I wasn't there. Okay. It would have been really interesting. It was really interesting, you know, and he kind of, looks uh what's the word without being (laughs) (laughs) uh he kind of had his trucker hat on you Mm -hmm. know so he's kind of like a dude kind of looking guy Mm -hmm. um he doesn't look particularly intelligent you know which (laughs) 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 see i went there that was terrible um but one of the things that he said that really made me think and which I really appreciate, you know, anytime an artist can make me think and can make me kind of question, then I'm, that's really exciting. So Mm -hmm. one of the things that he said was he only uses the first iteration of Google street view because, um, back then people didn't know what those cars were doing. Mm -hmm. So when they drove down the street, uh, you know, and took people's or took the, the, you know, photographs of the street, people weren't reacting to the car. They didn't Mm -hmm. know that their photograph was being taken. It was just this machine, you Mm -hmm. know, that was really kind of doing surveillance, you know, that where people weren't aware. Mm -hmm. Um, And he said, if I stood on that street corner and I took that picture, then people would be aware of me and they would act a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that to me was interesting, you know, that he's mining these images where the people really weren't aware, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that made me think, and I, and I appreciated him for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that people still get, you know, upset because he's, it's not true photography or it's not as hard as going out, you know, and doing street photography is, I think they're kind of missing the point in a way. And like, yeah. and when you put 
a stake in the sand like that, I'm mixing metaphors, but, um, you know, you're, you're missing being challenged, Mm -hmm. you know, you're missing thinking about things a different way. Yeah. You know, this whole Steve McCurry thing that everybody's all fired up about. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that's interesting to me is all the conversations about it, you know, and I just had a really cool Facebook conversation, which is weird in itself with, um, a guy, another college professor, uh, who lives in Fresno yesterday. And, you know, he was really angry about this whole thing happening with Steve McCurry. And he was saying, you know, the guy's such a hack and he's, um, fake as fuck, basically, (laughs) you know, fake AF and, uh, you know, that Steve McCurry doesn't deserve any of the things that has come to him, you know, just kind of all this stuff. And I was like, wow, it's, I'm really surprised at that reaction. Um, and then just having kind of this really interesting conversation with him Mm -hmm. about, you know, why, why is, and I think this, um, person I was talking to, one of the things that he really objected to wasn't the, the Photoshopping necessarily, or the, you know, the fact that it wasn't truth anymore or whatever, but, uh, what he was saying was that he had been to India. Um, he might actually even be maybe not originally from India, but his family is from India. Mm Um, so he's been there, you know, a number of times and tried to photograph and he said, it just doesn't look like that, you know? And so Steve McCurry is kind of presenting this like, you know, Disneyland version. Right. Right. That's the the same thing that, um, that the Teju Cole, did you read that piece? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, Teju Cole, right? He writes for the New York times Okay, and he's like there, he, he writes columns about photography. Okay. And, um, and he had a, a lengthy piece. Uh, this was before the the most recent photoshopping thing where he, um he was wasn't even really talking about um his te- technical methods right. or the photojournalism aspect but rather he was talking about how he was comparing two different two different photographers working in India and how McCurry's vision of India is really this sort of very colonial very yep. like you know um, romanticized yep. and it's a way of making India into something other than what it is right. in order to, for, for Western people, um, to feel good about it kind yeah. of where there's this other photographer whose name escapes me. I'll, I'll try to remember to find the link to the, this for the show notes, but there's this other photographer who lives in India and takes these pictures and they're kind of all over the place and mm-hmm. they look more like, what you think of as street photography instead of like national geographic photography and presents a really different, more vibrant living image of India as it is. Um, which is so interesting because when I think about people, what I call like travel photography, you mm -hmm. know, people that, um, you know, pay to go somewhere quote unquote exotic, Mm -hmm. you know, that where Westerners aren't necessarily, welcomed or where they, where it would be hard to kind of have access, Mm -hmm. um, that that becomes a little problematic. And there was a woman that I did a portfolio review for who had images in Ethiopia, um, that she had taken and she was very proud of them. They were beautiful images. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I was interested in was how did she have access to these supposedly indigenous people who were in, you know, their kind of native dress and acting, you know, kind of acting out, Mm -hmm. um, you know, their customs and their rituals and that kind of thing. And there were a few of her images where you kind of saw behind the scenes of that and sort of the handler or the fixer or whatever you want to call it, the person who had set up the, the, uh, you know, photo safari or travel adventure or whatever you want to call it. Um, and sort of seeing that behind the scenes. And it was a little, that to me was the interesting part. You yeah. know, that was the, that's where the story was. Mm-hmm. And I kind of tried to encourage her, you know, why don't you show this? You know, this is really, this is something. Mm-hmm. Um, and she wasn't interested in that. I think part of it is maybe she felt, some sense of guilt maybe, or Mm -hmm. it's a touchy subject for sure. Yeah. Uh, Because nobody wants to feel like a bad person, right? Right. Like nobody, nobody wants to think of themselves or what they're doing as racist. Right. But I mean, 
a lot of times you have to look more at because it, it, I think the problem with a, a word like racism is that when people think about it, they think of it in terms of something that a person is rather than what is this, what, how does this function? Right. Like what is, what is the, what is the end result of this? You know, what is the story, the narrative that this is propping up or tearing down? Yeah. Um, and, and that, that kind of analysis, especially when you're trying to apply it to yourself is really hard. Yeah. You know, I mean, I certainly have a lot of sympathy for that kind of thing. You, uh, you, you said before you think I don't get mad <laughs> about stuff. <laughs> I, I mean, there's definitely art that makes me angry. Yeah. Um, but getting so angry that you can't think about it, you know, like you just, I don't know, to me, it's pointless to kind of stand your ground and, and just, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like to not be able to have those conversations because mm -hmm. you've you know, said something that's so, you know, put your foot down or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you've shut down the conversation, I yeah. think is the thing that I try to avoid. You yeah. Know? And I don't see you doing that. Either. I try like, not to. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, it's also one of those things where you don't want to feel like you're ever telling people that like every conversation is equally important or valid. Right. You know? And like, for me, the thing I don't tend to get upset about is is stuff like, you know, technique or genre or aesthetic. Yeah. Exactly. But rather, like, if something's going to piss me off, it's because I look at the the work and, like, what is it saying? What? Yeah. How does it function? And if the thing that it's doing is, like, mean-spirited, then, right. then that will piss me off. Yeah. If it's mean-spirited to no purpose, right. you know? Um, Do you have an example? Oh, geez. People are going to get mad at me about this. But, yeah. like, I cannot stand Bruce Gilden's work. Like I just hate it. And the, the most recent one that everybody was talking about a few months ago of the like close up portraits, you know, of the like people passers by, I think they're at Coney Island or something, but they're like very harshly lit and it's yeah. like real tight facial close ups. And it's just like these people look grotesque and I, and I don't know. I'm like, on the one hand, I try to look at his, what he says about it. And he yeah. says, like, I think these people are beautiful. But I just have trouble trusting that right. because the, it doesn't appear to be in the, in the photograph. Like, the photograph really seems like, look at this freak. Yeah. You know? And that just, it's, it's always a question of, like, how much, how much I'm bringing to it and how much is intended. Yeah. And that's certainly a, a, a question worth having. I just can't look at those pictures. Like, yeah. they, they make me so unhappy you know yeah that's interesting there's um i guess it was in the maybe 40s or 50s um irving penn who's this you know really celebrated mm -hmm. fashion and celebrity photographer he did these like super ethnographic um photographs where he went to places like peru and um you know cameroon and uh I can't remember where else and like basically set up these little studios uh, and then would bring, you know, the natives in mm -hmm. to photograph them. And that pisses me off yeah, because of what he said about them. So there's this quote in the history book that I teach from that where he said something about the people that live in Cusco, Peru, about them being uh, like something like it's hard to believe that these quarters, three quarter sized uh you know, people that, it, you know, something about them being lazy or something that it was their ancestors that built the, you know, the temples around here or something mm -hmm. like that. Like he, it just was really wrong. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's, I don't know. It, and it's always a question too of like, I mean, this is a question not just for art, but just like in general of history, like how we look at historical figures, because I mean, so many people right now will cite pen as like, especially, you know, portraitists, mm -hmm. um, you know, pen for his technical mastery, right. Um, is a touchstone for so many people even today. And how do you like when, when you see people who are doing things like that and then end up being, you know, they're probably pretty racist, but then they're also a product of their times. Yeah. And how much of that do you excuse and how much do you not? And how yeah. much, like the same thing with Thomas Jefferson, you know, like, 
the, the dialogue around Thomas Jefferson as a historical figure has certainly changed even just in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, now we've been talking for like half an hour and we've barely talked about your work yeah. at all. <laughs> uh, so I apologize about that. That's all right. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I remember it was one of those things when I, when I saw that, um, pre-abandoned work, um, you know, when you talk about, you know, we've been talking about, uh, conceptual, uh, series yeah. based work and some people have a problem with that and, uh, but it is sort of the dominant mode yes, right absolutely. now. And your, I remember in those pictures, what, what I remember about them striking me is that they had, um, a really nice formal quality to them because they are so structural and you're looking at lines and it's like all, all the interiors. This is, you're looking at interiors of homes under construction in right. master plan communities. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so everything in it is like very blank, very yeah. white. If there's any color, like it's very subtle, yeah. like where I remember I, 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 one of them, it's like in a closet or something. And there's just this tiny little splash of like orangey pink. Yeah in like the, the little middle sunset light. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you could miss it if you weren't looking yeah. at it. And I, I love that. I love yeah. those little subtle things. But on top of that, it definitely, so I mean like just on a purely visual aesthetic level, it has, it's very pleasing to look at, but then it has that conceptual level where, you know, you're talking about, um, about communities, about, um, um, in a lot of ways it's about the financial crisis. Yep. Um, and that, you know, that's something, uh, I remember saying this to you at the time. It's, 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 it is hard to do that, to, to operate on more than one level that way. Yeah. And I think, you know, I have a, uh, bachelor's degree in graphic design. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, when I first started photography, it was about finding, you know, beautiful designs, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's, and that's just not enough anymore, you know? rarely do you see somebody who's just a purely abstract photographer with like zero concept. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't even think of one who's, you know, a contemporary person that has kind of gotten anywhere. You know, you just really have to have some sort of concept. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, one of the things that that series allowed me to do is to make photographs that I enjoyed looking at, mm -hmm. um, but also to, to kind of talk about something a little bit deeper um, and I think all of my work really, when I see kind of the, the arc of it is just questions like in starting discussions with people about what do we value as mm -hmm. a society and why, you know, why do we choose like for the master plan communities, uh, why do we choose to build that way? You know, not necessarily saying like that's bad or wrong, mm -hmm. um, but there are things that are problematic about it. And, and yet that's how we choose to live and mm -hmm. how we choose to, to kind of structure our, you know, larger communities. Uh, and, and why, you mm -hmm. know, why is, and I think, so I was born in Sweden. I lived there till I was 10. My mom's Swedish, my dad's American and, you know, just kind of Europe versus America and kind of, you know, the way that we, you know, commute the way that we, you know, don't mm -hmm. value, uh, public transportation in the same way, you know, just kind of all these things, um, you know, and just the way that we live. And these are all just kind of questions that I enjoy thinking about. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there are questions, I mean, any of these things, like in a lot of ways that, that series to me, seems like it's, it's, it's really sort of examining, the American dream, mm -hmm. right? Because so much of what, like, like if you look at the history of the financial crisis, that so much of it was wrapped up in the narrative of home ownership yep. as the ultimate expression of the American dream and yeah. whether or not that was legitimately attainable for people and why is it or is not. I mean, that, those are questions that I mean, obviously we're still struggling with, we've been struggling with forever. We probably will continue to. Yeah. There's a book. Um, I don't even remember the author, but, um, so I actually started when I very, very first started 
um, I was thinking about the housing crisis. It was in the middle of the housing crisis and I was actually photographing, um, short sales and foreclosures. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, a lot of them were in master plan communities because I didn't want to further victimize people who I thought were kind of at the, the realistic end of, you know, getting underwater with Mm -hmm. their houses. So I was looking at these, you know, million plus dollar homes where I kind of felt a little bit better about, you know, calling them out Mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, like, if you buy a, you know, $1.5 million house and then you can't afford to live in there, like, eh, you know, yeah, it's harder to have sympathy for them, I guess. But, um, you know, as I was doing that series, I, what I was seeing was that in these master plan communities, there, a lot of the builders in the same area were still building new homes mm-hmm. when there were people who had bought, you know, a year or two earlier that were now, you know, trying to, to get out of a, you know, trying to get out of their, their bad mortgage. So they were doing a short sale or they were, had already foreclosed Mm -hmm. and they were still building brand new homes that people were buying, which is just nuts to me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's kind of why I was trying to figure out why that happened. Um, and then I just got really fascinated with the whole master plan community phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was also a time where, um, you know, we were living in an area, um, which we actually still live in just, you know, a couple, like a mile away from where we were living before, but, um, where the schools were good, but they weren't great, you know, and, um, or at least that was my perception. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, you know, where do we move to where the schools are better? It's a little safer and my daughter can ride her bike down the street and, Um, you know, I can understand why that's appealing. Well, why is, you know, why are some of the only choices for that out, you know, in Scripps Ranch or Rancho Bernardo or Chula Vista or, you know, kind of really, Mm -hmm. really far out where the commute is terrible and, um, there's water issues and there's fire issues and, you know, it just, so all those questions I think were really interesting. And, um, I started this by saying there's a book, right? (laughs) That's like 10 minutes ago. Uh, so, you know, I would go to these uh, master plan community, uh, what do they call them? Model homes, right? Mm-hmm. And the level of emotional, emotionality to the marketing is pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and the book that I thought was really fascinating um, was called My Life Would Be Perfect If I Lived in That House or something. Mm. It, I, you know, I'm probably butchering the title, but this woman was just kind of talking about her just the American dream and kind of believing that if only she could, you know, live in one of these kind of perfect houses, um, that, you know, her life would be perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're really, those builders are really playing on that in a way that's a little bit, not a little bit, it's a lot disturbing, you know? And I, I remember asking one of the salespeople, you know, who does your interior decorating. And she said, well, we have in-house people that do that. And they Mm -hmm. work with very closely with the marketing department. And I was like, Oh, how does that work? You know, whatever. And she was kind of laughing, but saying, you know, we have a whole story about who lives here. You Mm -hmm. know, the little Susie is 16 years old and she likes horses and you know, that they come up with this whole fictitious family that lives in these model homes based on who they think is going to buy it, you know, which is, Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? Is that you look at these issues when you're first starting out, whatever your perspective might be. I mean, the idea about personal responsibility being is like, you know, definitely a major strain in a lot of people's narratives about Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But then when you take a little closer look, you start seeing more, a bigger picture, right? A bigger story where there are bigger systems at work. Right. And that, that definitely, it's the kind of thing that changes your perspective. Yeah. 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 An idea of like, well, if I'm going to be a good parent, you know, I need to find a great place for my kid to grow up. And, you know, the, the message is like, oh, this is the only, Mm -hmm. you know, this is the only option and this is what everyone's doing. And, you know, it just is a little, it's problematic. Yeah. As my friend would say. And it's, it's, it's real easy to fall into as well. Like I know when we first moved here, um, we had an apartment in Rancho Penasquitos, which is, you know, mm-hmm. it's sort of a nice, nice-ish neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and when we were looking to buy, we the only place that we could really afford someplace um, uh, 
that was not like really far from where I worked or, um, you know, sort of in a high crime neighborhood, right. um, was Mira Mesa. And we sort of said to ourselves, well, that'll be fine to start with. But you know, when we have kids and they start going to school, we'll want to move to a, a, a better neighborhood than that. And like that whole idea of better neighborhoods right. is like, like, why is that a, not a better neighborhood? And like, why do people say that about that neighborhood? Well, does it have something to do with the fact that most of the people that live there are Filipino? Probably, because hmm. actually the crime level there is very low, yeah. is is comparable to all of the surrounding nicer, quote unquote, nicer neighborhoods. The school performance is as good or better than most of the surrounding nicer neighborhoods. Right. And like, what is it about that neighborhood that people think isn't nice? And like you start eliminating these things and looking into the history of that neighborhood. And it kind of does come down to the fact that that is now it's like the, the one neighborhood in San Diego that's majority Asian, but notably it's not like quote unquote good Asian. Like it's not <laughs> like, that's the whole thing, right? Yeah. Like, like if a neighborhood was like, had a lot of Chinese or Japanese or Korean people in it, that'd be one thing. But if it's like, that neighborhood is mostly Vietnamese and Filipino has a totally different context. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, 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 it is a thing. And, you know, now we've lived in that neighborhood 10 years and our kids go to the public schools there and we like never want to move, Yeah. you know, cause, cause I'm actually now I'm, I'm really happy that this is where we've sort of settled. Yeah. Um, I don't want to pat myself on the back too much for that. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's not like I'm like some, like, I, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but yeah, it's interesting I, too, like the, the thing that you were saying about, you know, um, narrative and looking closer, um, that definitely speaks to, uh, your more recent, your newer body of yeah. work as well. Yeah. Let me go back to one thing that I, about the, the housing thing, um, I think what a lot of people don't, well, if you don't think about it too hard, you know, it's kind of the easy choice, right? I'm mm. going to move to this master plan communities to community and, you know, we're going to have this nice home for, you know, less than it would cost kind of in the city center. And, you know, my kid's going to go to a great school with good test scores and, uh, you know, we're going to have the cul-de-sac and the kid can, you know, ride or bike there or whatever. Mm. But, there's a, there's huge drawbacks, you know, not to mention commuting and all that kind of stuff, but like, then you live in a place where everybody is just like you mm -hmm. and that, that lack of diversity and that kind of lack of challenge, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, is, I don't think the best way for a kid to grow up, you yeah. know? Um, and just kind of knowing that there's other situations out there that there's other types of families out there that there's a, you know, is I think really, really valuable. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So your newer body of work, um, it's, uh, we've actually touched on several different things, um, so far in the conversation that, that relate to your new body of work. We've talked about, um, looking closer mm -hmm. at, uh, different, um, social phenomena. We've talked about appropriation yep. and, um, and that is definitely both of those things are a big part of, uh, what you're working on now. Yeah. Um, we've talked a few times about your new work cause I've seen, you've shown it before in our, our group meetings mm -hmm. and I saw it at medium last year. Right. Um, and I find it really interesting. You also know it makes me super duper uncomfortable, yep. but that's the point, right? Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. 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 You know what? It makes me uncomfortable too, uh -huh. which is, um, sometimes I think, why did I go down this rabbit hole? <laughs> I mean, it really, yeah. Like, cause it's the thing that I didn't really think about or mm -hmm. think through the whole way now that I'm kind of, you know, a two years in a year and a half in, um, we should say what, what it is. Yeah, we should. So it's called not my daughter. And that title came kind of after the fact of, you know, 
kind of as I was looking at why I was doing what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So what I'm doing is re-photographing um, uh, pornographic magazines. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, what I came to was they're all now Hustler magazines mm-hmm. because they're, uh, they're ones that show uh, sex acts, you know, in the magazines. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so what I do is I fold the pages or I point the camera in certain ways so that you don't see any of the sex acts. You don't see the penetration that is in all the pictures. What you see is the woman or women who are performing these Mm -hmm. sex acts. And the idea is to try to isolate them in a way where we start to look at them as real people. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I don't know if it works, but um, that's kind of the idea. And Mm -hmm. And I think it comes... You know, so I grew up in a Christian family, um, but, you know, my parents are also very liberal. So Mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, sex is reserved for marriage, um, but, you know, we don't judge other people, you know, for their choices is kind of, you know, that's Mm -hmm. sort of how I, uh, you know, go about my my life, I guess, you know. Um, And to me the thought of being in those women's shoes is just kind of horrifying. Um, but I also am so conscious of not judging them for their decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, like I absolutely realize that, you know, people have different levels of comfort with their sexuality and with, um, just their bodies and, you know, that kind of thing. And so, this I absolutely never want to get into the position where I feel like I need to save these women. Yeah. You know, they are very powerful. Um, you know, if they're in hustler, they're, they're doing okay. You mm-hmm. know, they're, they're making money, they're making a living. And, um, you know, there, there are definitely other people who are, you know, under age or who are exploited in some way, but I don't, I don't see these women as being, um, you know, they might be sort of exploited by the system, I guess, you know, or mm-hmm. the kind of the way that they ended up there. But, but for the most part, they're making these choices and they're happy with their decisions, right? They're, they're, they feel very empowered, you mm-hmm. know, they feel very good about this. Um, but I think one of the things that bothers me about it is that the way that men use those magazines, you know, 99% of the people I think who buy those magazines are men or who look at that stuff on the, mm-hmm. on the web. Um, I don't think that they're thinking about who these women are or the, the fact that they're, you know, real people and that they have real ideas and real thoughts. And I don't think that they think of them as empowered women. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they think of them as if they think about them at all, you know, they're, they're objects, they're mm-hmm. characters, I guess. Um, and so all that kind of went into this idea and, and I, I kind of realized that the title, not my daughter is sort of, it's a little over the top. It's a little loaded. It's loaded. Yeah. But I mean, the idea of thinking, and this is where it gets really uncomfortable for me Mm -hmm. is thinking about my daughter who's nine, that this, you know, is a, this could be a choice for her, you Mm -hmm. know, and thinking like, oh my God, that just just because I'm putting myself in their shoes and thinking that that would be a horrible way to live. Right. Like Mm -hmm. that I'm thinking I want to like protect her from that. You know, it's just, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think one of the, one of the best things that's come out of this is the discussions, you know, like, Mm -hmm. so this discussion with you or just discussion with, with people about, you know, agency and the, the women feeling empowered and that kind of thing. And I actually, I think the best conversation I had was um, with one of my husband's friends, who's a an athlete. He's an engineer. He's um, a dude. You know, mm-hmm. he's a, a bro or whatever. Uh, <laughs> not a not a super intellectual. I mean, he's very intelligent, mm-hmm. but he's not. Uh, he doesn't think about social issues. I don't think. Right. You know, to to any extent. And uh, I guess he's very into pornography and his, his wife is as well. And they're, you know, fine with it. Um, and 
you know, he had said, Hey, I, you know, I hear you're doing this photography series about pornography. Like I want to see it, you know, it's, I bet it's awesome or whatever. And I showed it to him and he, and we talked about it and he was actually, I think for the first time thinking about, you know, kind of these questions that I'm asking, right? Mm -hmm. Like who are these women? Um, you know, the fact that they're somebody's daughter, that they're somebody's, uh, you know, sister or whatever. Like, I know it sounds super cliche, but I, I really don't think he'd ever thought about it or allowed himself to think about that. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I hope I didn't like ruin porn for him or whatever. <laughs> I mean, maybe I do hope I did, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I just think that conversation is is really interesting to have. And it's, it's uncomfortable, you know, so we're like sitting around this table, you know, and I'm talking to him about it and my husband's like cringing, you Mm -hmm. know, but I think it's, these are important conversations to have. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, this thing, it's like anything, right? Like you come to these, to these investigations, if you want to call it that you come, you come in with a certain set of ideas and that is going to be informed by what your particular life experience has been. And there's always the danger of being trapped by that. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, in talking to you about how you're thinking, how you've been thinking about this project, um, over the past several months, um, it seems to me like you are aware of that, right? Like, because, because that is really what, you know, you could imagine somebody, this thing, the thing that you said, like, you don't want to be in a position of seeing yourself as saving anybody. Yeah. But I mean, there are a lot of people out there who want to do exactly that yeah. for a lot of different reasons. And, but I think the the reason that I want to stay away from that is that that takes all the power away from them. Like, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it, in a lot of ways, that's, it's very, um, arrogant to say like, I'm going to save you from something that you chose to do, Mm -hmm. you know, like it just takes all their agency away. And, Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do think it's important that we as a society remember that these are women with ideas and thoughts and, um, that they are somebody, I keep using the word beloved, like they're somebody's beloved, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think, see, I get a little teared up when I say that word because I think that is a very Christian word. Mm -hmm. Um, or, a for me, it's a, um, like it's a word that, that means that no matter what choices you make, you know, God loves you, your family loves you. Um, and that, that's kind of what I'm trying to communicate. You know, Mm -hmm. these are not, you know, they're not sluts. They're not, whores they're somebody's beloved Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i mean this whole the whole conversation that we're i think i think right now you like we're having a real moment right now i feel like (laughs) is it because i got tears in my eyes well i mean (laughs) oh in in not just right here just you and me Ah, yes but i think the conversation (laughs) that you and i are having is 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 part of a larger conversation that that we as a as a culture are having a lot of conversations right now that with a lot more nuance than has happened in the past. Yeah. Um, and a big part of that has to do with, um, voices that were previously marginalized, marginalized becoming part of the conversation as well. And it like, you're hearing this other, these other voices as part of your investigation. The, the, like I think anybody who thinks that pornography is a real cut and dry issue in one direction or the other is missing a big part of the narrative and is missing, you know, like it is a complicated issue. And like, like there is definitely like, there is definitely something to be said about the fact that, you know, it does the way that it is consumed in our society by men in a patriarchal context does have effects for, for how, how women are disempowered by these men who consume it. 
Um, or even if they don't consume it, right? It's like symptomatic of a patriarchal culture. Yeah. And like this whole thing with um, like this Brock Turner case that's right. going on right now. It's like this is... That's like, something I did to get really upset about yeah, it. Like obviously. on Facebook I posted, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. When I mean, his dad, oh my the, God. The, the dad was like almost... I mean, I don't oh, know if it's worse because like... Yeah. But still, I mean, like you can see where it all comes from. Yeah. And to say that pornography and its use has no no, no bearing on that, I think is... I mean, that's... That's not true. On the other hand, like when you see like sex worker advocates, for example, talking about how, you know, their industry is wrongfully stigmatized and they want to claim that uh, more agency than what people are willing to admit. Right. I mean, that is also true. And it's part of the Like, so you have like these different parts of the conversation that all have validity to them. Yeah. And, and that, it's tricky. Yeah. It's real tricky walking down that tightrope. And what I think is so interesting is that the way that I'm kind of becoming part of that conversation is weird in a way because mm -hmm. it's through photography. And in a lot of ways, the photography is not necessary to have those conversations. But somehow by putting this body of photographic artwork out there, it allows me at least to have some of those conversations, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But in a lot of ways, the conversations have nothing to do with the photography. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like the photography is a, or the art is a vehicle to have the discussions, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sort of does get like what the purpose of art in general is. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's like a whole, like we could, we could definitely, we could have a whole semester about that. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. But it's, I mean, in some ways it's so fascinating because if I think about the amount of time and energy I spend working on this series that has n that is not actually making photographs mm -hmm. is like the majority, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, the amount of the energy that's spent on the actual photography is pretty small, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of all in my head or it's all in discussion or it's in, yeah, research or, you know, all these kind of different things that, um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we should probably take a little break real quick. Okay. Um, but yeah, and then we'll, we'll come right back. Okay. So for the second segment, I always ask people to bring their own topic. <laughs> There's this other podcast I was listening to. They, they do something similar. It's called the poetry gods. If you haven't heard it, it's, mm. if you have any interest in poetry, it's fantastic, okay. but they always do a thing. There's just at the beginning where they say, what's, well, on your mind. <laughs> so, so I ask people to bring their own topics. Um, what would you like to talk about? Well, when I was thinking about this, I think, um, you know, what I spend a lot of my time and energy on is mm -hmm. building community. Yes. Um, so, uh, there's just a lot that I'm involved in and kind of new things that I've involved in that, um, I just, it's just a huge passion of mine. And I think, you know, being an educator is kind of the easiest thing to, uh, to point to there. So, you know, teaching and, uh, and just kind of the way I teach too, you know, where I'm just really like building people up and helping them find their way and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, and then, um, you know, even like my work at MOPA as a docent, you know, it's really about helping people understand what's hanging on the wall and helping them feel empowered to say like, I don't like this and talk about, you know, why don't you like it? And, mm -hmm. uh, instead of kind of this ivory tower organism, you know, institution where, uh, you know, this is good art and this is what you should like, you mm -hmm. know, I don't think MOPA is about that. And, um, in fact, I know they're not about that and, <laughs> and, you know, helping to kind of facilitate that is exciting to me. And, um, I'm, uh, the chairperson for the West region of the society for photographic education. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a community of, um, people who are mostly educators, but also students, um, in photography. And, um, you know, that's just a really exciting thing. And then, uh, starting this open show, um, yes. initiative with, um, Chris Moore, mm -hmm. uh, her and I are the lead producers. Um, and that's just really cool. So, um, you are actually, uh, part of the inaugural uh open show in san diego yeah, yeah. which was that was through jonas because right. he he does the open show chapter in la exactly yeah so yeah. that's how it kind of came on my radar was going to hear you speak and um i can't remember who else it was uh, me brenda, um, brenda biondo uh -huh. um steven strom 
and there was a fourth person, and I'm kicking myself. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Yeah. Um, but it just was, it was a really cool event because it was a different way to experience photography. John du- know- sorry, John Dubois. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. John Dubois. Um, a, you know, different way to experience photography. Like typically we just see it on the wall. Um, you know, most of the time it's on the mm-hmm. wall or, or wherever we're seeing it and there's not a discussion, mm-hmm. um, you know, with the artists. So just to have those discussions and even at medium where people are talking about their work, um, there's, you know, a little bit of a, of time to ask questions, but this is a more community based, uh, community building type, um, thing where, you know, people are encouraged to, uh, kind of respond during the, when the artists are speaking about their work, but also there's really a, you know, kind of social aspect of it or, mm-hmm. you know, social mixing type time where you're as an audience member, just really encouraged to chat with the artist about their work, mm-hmm. um, which I think is just really cool, you know, for yeah. artists to get feedback and for, um, people to just feel empowered to, to ask questions and yeah. get feedback and yeah. So it's really cool. So that was in 2014, mm-hmm. I believe at medium. And that, like you said, was um, put on by Jonas who runs the Los Angeles chapter of open show. And so open show is actually a national organization. I think and, it's international, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. Actually yeah. you are right. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all volunteer run. And so it just takes somebody saying, you know, I want to run a chapter in my city. And so, um, I got together with my friend Chris and, and I said, you know, do you think we could do this? Do you think it'd be fun? And, and, uh, I kind of talked to her into it, but <laughs> she's on board. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, I think it'd be really cool. And I, I think it's really, I think the most exciting thing is that we have sponsors who are big, players um, yeah, in like San Mopa Diego. is, involved, Mopa in this, is right? involved as a sponsor and as a venue um mm-hmm. SDAI the San Diego Art Institute um Ginger is involved as a venue and as a sponsor the Medium Festival Scott Davis um and he runs um something called Photo Lab which mm-hmm. is um you know just all about promoting um things you know kind of mm-hmm. all the things that are happening in our community they're involved. Um, I think, uh, an organization called outside the lens, um, is also going to hop on board too. Um, and it's just really, I mean, these are big, big players, you know? Yeah. So the fact that we kind of have their seal of approval and kind of that they're on board to help, um, I think the venue, you know, having a place to do it is one of the big hurdles. Mm-hmm. Um, so to have those nailed down is just really exciting. And these really, um, you know, Mopa's theater is gorgeous. SDI, SDAI's space is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to uh, alternate between those two spaces. And um, just to give artists, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes each, uh, five each uh, time. So I don't know if that made any sense. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah so every quarter, so um, four times a year, we're going to have one of these open show events and, um, people will submit to, um, be allowed to speak and then we'll do a little, you know, curation to kind of figure out, um, what the best program for the evening will be. And then, so each time five artists will each be given 10 to 15 minutes to just speak about their work. So mm-hmm. there's a, a slideshow of, um, between 15 and 25 images that will just show as the artist speaks about the work. Um, and then people will have a chance to talk, um, you know, as they're speaking or later on kind of in a more informal setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just think it's going to be really exciting, you know, and it's been really fun just to reach out to people for this first one to, um, you know, kind of encourage them and say, you know, you're doing really interesting work. Would you, you know, be interested in talking about it? And, you know, that kind of gives people a boost. And, um, so yeah, it's been really been really cool. Um, yeah. Chris and I sometimes do little photo walks mm-hmm. and, uh, for my birthday, um, which was what, two weeks ago or something. Yeah. Happy birthday. Um, thank you. Um, mine's next week. Awesome. Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> uh, uh, we typically, when we go on these photo walks, she's very, uh, adamant that we don't go together. You know, mm-hmm. she wants to, to just, uh, 
kind of go on her own. And I said, well, it's my birthday, so I want to go together, <laughs> which isn't as good for the photography, but it's better for the social aspect. So anyway, we were wandering around um, Ocean Beach, and within five minutes of being an OB, uh, we had met uh, – a, a couple who was really interested in my camera. It's my, it's my camera that gets them because I'm shooting with an old Hasselblad right now. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we had that, had that conversation and then we had run into this guy who is, uh, an artist and, um, is going to submit to open show. And we just stood there and had like a 45 minute conversation with him just about the work he's doing and the, you know, work that I'm doing. There's some, mm-hmm. uh, kind of crossover there. And it's just that, those opportunities to build each other up and to, you know, kind of just talk to people, I think is really fun and yeah. exciting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, you know, I'm all about cool. the conversation. Yes, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I actually, um, I, I said this to you before we started. Um, like I think San Diego, I, I was talking to Scott about this, Scott yeah. Davis. And, um, this was a couple years ago that, that, I was really excited and and gratified that he's doing medium here. Yeah. Because one thing about San Diego, it's like the, I think, seventh or 11th biggest city in the United States. Hmm. Uh, And it's the second biggest in California. Yep. There's one point. Bigger than San Francisco. Oh, way bigger. Yeah. It's, I mean, the city of San Diego itself isn't bigger, I think, than the whole, uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley metro, but the city of San Francisco is actually not that big. Well, okay. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. But like, but yeah, the, the San Jose, San Francisco, uh, metro is bigger, but San Diego as a city is way bigger. Yeah. Yeah, That makes Um, sense. And it's pretty comparable actually. Um, I think there's like 1.3 million people here now, Hmm. which even like when I moved here, it was like 1.1. So I mean, that's like a lot. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of kids in your family. So. <laughs> <laughs> you pumped that number up. I, yeah. By moving here. <laughs> All those 200,000 of my kids. Um, I, I feel so bad for my wife. <laughs> she's, she's a saint. <laughs> um, but you know, it's a big, it's a pretty big sizable city and there's a lot of money here, um, with between tech and between like La Jolla, yeah. Uh, it's there, but the art community here is really undersized yeah. and I have long thought that a big part of that is that we don't have as many opportunities to get together and do things. Mm. So stuff like medium and stuff like now open show, um, there's a guy whose name is Chris Fessenden who does a program called the artist odyssey. Oh yes. And, um, um, you know, they do openings like every month or every other month, like either like they're doing one this, this coming Saturday. Um, by the time this airs, it will have been long past, but, um, you know, they're, they're doing a slideshow up in Encinitas and really having the ability for me, I try to make it to one of these things every month or so. And it just means so much to get to see people's faces, to get Mm -hmm. to spend time, and it's just like, I really feel like something is happening that yeah. like very soon San Diego is going to have a certain critical mass and like, we're not close to being LA or San Francisco yet, but I think that, you know, with the right push and part of that is stuff like what you're doing and what Chris is doing and what Scott is doing. Um, and hopefully what I'm doing, I mm-hmm. don't know, um, with the right push, like this, this town will be. A, a, an important art town. Yeah. Um, and getting, and being able to see the beginning of that is exciting. Yeah, it is. It really is. Yeah. yeah. And I, this might be very Pollyanna of me, but I, I feel like if you compare the vibe here to like LA or definitely LA, but maybe even San Francisco, it's a much more positive vibe here, I think. Hmm. Um, and maybe that's just cause that's what it's, going to take to kind of get it rolling. Like maybe it used to be more positive in LA. I Mm. I mean, I, I just, when I think about medium and the way that Scott has built medium, Mm -hmm. it is remarkable in how positive it is. Yeah. Um, and I know he would kind of shrug his shoulders and say, you know, whatever, but if (laughs) like, if you go to other portfolio reviews, Mm -hmm. um, it is a remarkably different, um, feeling and a mm-hmm. different, uh, 
mentality. You know, I think it's other places are much more competitive. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think San Diego in general, and I think absolutely medium is much more inclusive and more helping, you know, even the reviewers feel, I feel like they are there to help, you know, and Mm -hmm. that is absolutely not the case at other, uh, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but you know, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, honestly, part of it is that Scott treats the review as well. You mm-hmm. know, they're not there for weeks on end, you know, kind of one after the other, after the other, after the other, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable schedule. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's still probably pretty grueling, but, and I think people just feel appreciated mm-hmm. in, in a way that probably doesn't happen at other places, you know, and that, then that feeling of being appreciated, they're, those reviewers are more likely to be, uh, you know, positive and and helpful towards the people that they're reviewing. And I think another organization that does that really well is um, SPE, Society for Photographic Education. Mm-hmm. When there's reviews there, that I think that's the same idea there too, because everybody's kind of in it together, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but you know, some of the bigger kind of you know photo festivals, um, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, and just even like at medium, the fact that, uh, you know, the people that are there to speak, there's not this sort of hierarchy that they're kind of the ones who've, you know, made it. And then there's, they're kind of lesser thans that are there to hear them speak. It's mm-hmm. kind of everybody feels like everybody's on the same. Yeah. They've level. been very yeah. accessible. Yep. Um, yeah which is great for somebody like me who likes to hear the sound of his own voice in a Q and a, um, uh, people have been very, uh, very, uh, accommodating of that <laughs> impulse of mine. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, everybody talks about how medium feels like a real family, yeah. um, atmosphere. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm excited for, for something like open show, uh, you know, I know you and Chris, I mean, I know the two of you personally right. already, but, um, you know, because these events are, you know, like I, I've looked at some of the lineups that Jonas has done up in, in LA and I, obviously I was part of one once mm-hmm. here and it's, you know, having lots of, you know, all different levels of people coming together and being able to have a more intimate dialogue. Um, you know, you're not, you're not, um, it's not like giving a lecture. It's like, you know, it's a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I know for myself, like when I go to an opening, like one of the reasons I like going to openings rather than just going to see shows on an off day is that the chance to, to be there and have like five minutes with the artist is fantastic because you can really like my experience so far is like, I, I remember when I first started, I really had this impression that, like, like what you were saying, like, like these are the people who have made it. And then there's the lesser than, right. and I'm one of the lesser than, and like, obvious, I mean, on, not obviously, but honestly, I, I do still have that sort of neurosis. Uh, but like at every turn, whether it's been at medium, whether I've gone to a thing at MOPA, a thing at like the SDSU downtown gallery mm-hmm. or one of, um, Chris Fessenden's artist odyssey things like almost every single person has been very approachable. And I would have this idea that like, Oh, these are these art people and they're like, not going to give me the time of day. And, and even like now I, today I have a small, a tiny amount of, of recognition just because I've, I've been around long enough that a couple people have heard of me ever. It doesn't happen very often, but like I have a little bit of a resume now and people ask for your autograph on the street. Obviously. Oh, well there's that too, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I, you know, you gotta be prepared to pay for that. Right. I mean this, you don't get this for free. Yeah. You, you can't eat in a restaurant anymore. No, no, no. All the damn paparazzi. <laughs> no, but I mean like at, like now I, I find like, it's, it's, it's very gratifying, but also kind of strange that like occasionally, like, you know, somebody will, will receive me as a peer that I wouldn't think of that way. Right. But, but even before I had anything that would approach an artistic career, almost universally, these artists were, were very opening, very, very open, very welcoming, very, um, uh, willing to, to talk about, yeah 
you know, this stuff and it, and yeah. well, I think, I mean, you kind of hit on it. It, I think most of us realize that it's a journey, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not like even the people that have, you know, so-called made it, they're still on a journey, mm-hmm. you know, and they still, you know, question themselves and they still have ups and downs and, you know, and if mm-hmm. they're, they're not complete assholes, then they kind of remember, you know, <laughs> that at one point they were <laughs> down there kind of, you know, struggling or, I, I don't know. It's, you know, I think one of the really cool things about open show is going to be showing people at all different stages of the journey, you mm-hmm. know, and, and not only that, but people in all different genres, you know, we kind of tend to, you know, get kind of stuck, not stuck, but you know, we, we'd gravitate towards people who are doing like similar work to ours, mm-hmm. you know? So the openings that I typically go to are photographers and, um, they're doing more, you know, kind of art conceptual type stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be, you know, we're really trying to make an effort to have not only photographers, but filmmakers, multimedia producers, um, to have, you know, photojournalism and documentary and, mm-hmm. and art and, uh, you know, all kinds of, of different stuff to just, um, kind of help give everybody a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, I'm hoping to get students in there too, you know, people who are kind of at the beginning of the journey, um, as well. Um, and it, it's a little bit difficult because I also want to make sure that the, that the level of engagement is, is high, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure that you're, that you have something that's going to draw people to mm-hmm. come. Right. So, uh, but I don't know. I mean, maybe, People would come if it was all students. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. you said people came to the yeah. year. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think, I mean, what's going to draw people and keep people coming is if they're, if what people are talking about is interesting, you mm-hmm. know, and if it's engaging um, and makes people think. So that's kind of what we're going for in our little curation process. So, yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to yeah. it. Um. So I'm not quite sure when this is going to air, but like, when's the first? Gonna... The first open show is July 14th. Okay, um, so this will air in time then. Okay, very cool. Yeah, so it's at the Museum of Photographic Arts in Balboa Park. Um, it is, I don't have it in front of me. I think it's, we said from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, and part of that, obviously, is the, um, you know, kind of social time the mixer time, Mm -hmm. uh, people aren't going to be talking for three hours. So that's, (laughs) that's a plus. Uh, the talking part is, um, usually about an hour and a half, about 10 to 15 minutes for five people. So Mm -hmm. with some introductions and, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really, really cool. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. And where can people find you? Um, so my website is Mm amandadahlgren.com. Um, and you just have to know to spell my name, correctly, which is <laughs> difficult to you, you, I'm sure know. Uh, so Dahlgren is D A H L, uh, G R E N. Mm-hmm. And, um, open show is open show.org and, uh, Mopa is Mopa.org. And mm-hmm. what is medium? It's uh, medium San Diego.org. Okay. That's yeah. a good one. Uh, yeah. who else can we plug? <laughs> uh, S P E national.org. S P E is a fantastic organization. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. That was my conversation with Amanda Dahlgren. If you'll be in the San Diego area on July 14th, please do check out the upcoming open show event. As she mentioned, it's from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Museum of Photographic Arts. I put a link in the show notes to the event page so you can see the list of featured artists. And also, the next two events are already scheduled, one for October 22nd as part of the Medium Festival of Photography, and then the next on December 14th. And as of the time this airs, submissions for both are still open. If you've got any questions and comments for me, you can get at me at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. You can also find me and the show on Twitter at channelopenpod or on Facebook at facebook.com slash keep the channel open. If you'd like to help support the show, the best way to do that is to leave a rating or review on iTunes, help get our ranking higher so new listeners can find the show more easily. And of course, you can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. 
Next week, I'll be talking with Aline Smithson, whom many of you may know as the editor of Lens Scratch, so look forward to that. And as always, until then, remember, keep the channel open. Mm-hmm.